The message I want to try to share today, if you want to turn your Bibles to Matthew's Gospel, Matthew chapter 6. I've preached this text before about a year ago. In fact, it's what I was intending to preach last Sunday, and my thoughts were shifted, and so instead I had preached a message, advice to seekers. Um, but this kind of hung back on me a little bit this week, and I, I didn't put a lot of thought into it. In fact, I started studying something completely different, and... Uh, Felt my heart really moved by it. And then when I step back, I'm like, huh, that's kind of the same point. And so um, I want to try to pull this together today. And, and some of this is going to be a review. You may remember some of these points from about a year ago when we preached through this text. But I want to try to build on that today. And the topic on our heart is the danger of a divided heart. The danger of a divided heart. We're going to read here in Matthew's Gospel in the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus is speaking about where your treasure is. If you want to read along, starting in verse 19, it says, Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Let's keep reading. The light of the body is the eye. If therefore thine eye be single, thy whole body shall be full of light. But if thine eye be evil, thy whole body shall be full of darkness. And if therefore the light that is in thee be darkness... How great is that darkness. No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. So let's pray together before we go further this morning. Gracious God and King, we come to you together as a congregation gathered around your word this morning, thankful for the worship that we've experienced, thankful most of all for your precious son, Jesus Christ, Lord, the one in whom you pronounced yourself that you are well pleased with him, Lord. And I know that he sits right now at the right hand of your throne, even interceding for us today. We're grateful for him. And it's our desire to magnify him, Lord, and magnify him to the place where our hearts, Lord, would also worship and adore him, that our hearts would be united, not divided, Lord, but united within ourselves uh, with him supreme over all things. Help us, Lord, today. Speak into our hearts, Lord, as only you can. I'm grateful for your spirit, Lord. Jesus promised that you would give that spirit to be able to work in us and to accomplish your work. And Lord, I know for your work to be accomplished in this world it starts within me, and it starts within the hearts of each one present. And Lord, I pray that you would do something today in us that would be enduring and lasting, that would magnify your name in this place and in this world. We ask it for Jesus' sake. Amen. My burden is building on our revival. We were blessed with some wonderful worship. We're blessed to see some fruit from our efforts and my desire is that we not regress, but that we build on these things. And I know it's very easy for us to, to slip backwards and, and stand in need of, of being awakened again. In this passage, Jesus has just finished talking uh, about true religion, heartfelt religion versus surfacy religion. He was talking about how to pray and how to give and how to fast. And don't do it to be seen, but, but do it to honor and please God. And then he jumps into this passage. And then after this passage, he's about to talk about anxiety and not worrying about all the different things that you think you need or want in this world. In fact, uh, as you look here at the very end of this, it talks about you cannot serve God and mammon. That word mammon means money or wealth. And that connects us back to the beginning of this passage, verse 19, which says, where is your treasure at? Where is your treasure? What are, what's really important to you? But this is bigger than money. This is much bigger than just 
money, how you feel about money. It's truly about where your treasure is. And so before we talk about where your treasure is, I wanted to say, what is your treasure? What is it in your life that is your treasure? What's most important? This passage talks about laying up treasures, which means to uh, spend effort to gather something more and more. Literally in the Greek, it means treasuring up treasures. What is your treasure? How do you know what your treasure is? Well, your treasure is where your greatest joy is found. And so you think in yourself, if you want to be reflective here for a moment, where do I find my greatest joy? What occupies my thoughts, my, my, my resources, my time? That's likely where your treasure is. And we find in Scripture that, you know, the things we tend to treasure, oftentimes these things are not inherently bad. It's just what we do with it, right? We have the ability as humans, as image bearers of God, we can take anything and make it into an idol. We can take anything and twist and distort it and make it more than it was meant to be. Because everything that God's made in this world is good. All that God made is good. He declared it good. It's what we tend to do with it that can make it a bad thing. All things were made to be enjoyed by God and, and, and to give thanks to God. And, and there are many things that can come into our hands in our life that if we, as we receive this, we recognize that every good and perfect gift comes from where? Above, right? That God's brought this into my life and God has allowed me to enjoy it. And so as I enjoy this thing, I see God in it. I thank God for it. I praise Him. I keep my heart and my eyes fixed on Him. It can be all good. But when we start to stare at it too much, start to value it too much, we can become distorted. And it can take a place in our heart, in our lives, that should belong only to God. And so we start to make it our treasure rather than God being our treasure, right? We can make that thing our treasure, or we can also do something else dangerous. We can start to see ourselves in it and adore ourselves, kind of like Satan was, right? When he saw his beauty that God gave him, and he just kept staring at himself and thinking, I'm just the most beautiful thing that's ever been made. And he began to worship himself. You see, our treasure, as I mentioned, it's the thing that, that attracts our attention, our time, and our resources. And when something starts to take more of us than it should get, it becomes very dangerous. When it starts to get more of our heart than it should have, more of our attention, more of our resources, more of our thoughts, finding our joy in this thing, we can get contorted and distorted in our very hearts. And here's the thing, it doesn't have to be a thing. It could be a person or persons. It could be a position that we want to acquire. It could be accomplishing something. It's not just money. Money can be something that drives a lot of us, but there's way more things that can twist and distort our hearts than just money alone. Jesus saw this as a major issue with people. Our text this morning, the, the idea behind it is something he repeated to people in a lot of different ways at different times. During his ministry, Luke's gospel tells us that there were a lot of people that followed him. And when there was this great crowd following him, he literally turned at one point and said to them, if any man would come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yea, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. And whoever, whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. It's really the same thing he's talking about in this passage about the heart. It's really the same thing. He saw all these people following him, and, and that, that on the surface looks really good. It looks like, like I'm counting Jesus as important. But Jesus saw through the surface of things. He saw where people's hearts were really at, and he says, look, 
You can't really follow me if I'm not first. And he said something that was really hard to hear. You got to hate mother, father, sister, brother, husband, etc., kids, all that if you're really going to follow me and be willing to sacrifice. Because Jesus knows what following him is really about and what it would require. And he also knew that a lot of these people were following him because Jesus could give them food, Jesus could heal diseases, Jesus could make their life that they wanted to live better. And so that's why they followed Jesus. Because I think he can make the life I want to live better. And so he said this really hard thing to make them stop and reflect and think for a moment about where their heart was really at. And that's the point of our message today. It really is for us to stop and reflect and think, where is my heart really at? Where is Jesus in relationship to everything, everyone else in my life? Because Jesus sought to expose their hearts so that he could change their hearts, right? Not just to leave you there. In this passage, and we talked about this last year when we preached on this passage, there are limitations, when your heart treasures something that's tied to this earth, people, possessions, accomplishments, positions, whatever, and not God, you're in danger. Jesus explains in this passage, don't lay up treasures on earth where what happens? Moth and rust corrupts, where thieves break through and steal. Put your treasure in heaven. It needs to be with the Lord, where he's at, what he desires, because there... There's no moth and there's no corruption and thieves don't steal it. And then he throws this punchline in because where your heart, or where, where your treasure is, that's where your heart's going to be too. So there's a lot, a lot in there, but y'all heard the real estate slogan, location, 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 right? Same house can have two completely different price tags on it based upon whether it's by the lake or whether it's someplace undesirable. The landfill. Right? Same exact house, two different locations. You'd pay a lot more for the house by the lake, wouldn't you? Right? And so Jesus is pointing out, I mean, in this passage, five times you see the word where. Jesus is thinking, wanting us to think about where is our treasure, because there will be our heart. Earthly treasures, they depreciate, they lose value, they decay, and they ultimately disappear. And again, Jesus says this sentiment in a lot of different ways uh, at different times. Jesus said to his disciples in, Ma in Matthew 16, If anyone will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me, for whosoever will save his life shall lose it, and whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. Because what is it profited a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul. And so Jesus says, if you are trying to define your life and hold on to everything that's important to you in this world, you're going to what? You're going to lose it all. But those who would be willing to lose it and seek something higher will find that they will gain their life. It's the same point from the Sermon on the Mount here. Earthly treasures do not last. Whatever it is that you think is going to be, bring so much joy and value to your life, you're going to find that you're going to lose it. In this passage, Jesus lays out a negative and a positive. And this is important. This has really caught my heart as I was studying this passage. He doesn't just say it positively. He also says it negatively. He doesn't just say, hey, lay up treasures in heaven. He says, don't lay up treasures on earth, but lay up treasures in heaven. I had a neighbor one time in Alaska when we first moved to Anchorage. He, um, he went to a, a Bible church locally. And a uh, really, really nice guy, and we'd have conversations. I remember one of the conversations over the fence one time, and uh, I was talking about some of the dangers of, of um, I, I don't know if it was easy believism or something like that, but I was talking about 
some of the things to watch out for, you know, with, with a lot of present state of Christianity. And, and he just said, uh, why don't you say that positively? I was like, what? He's like, well, you're, you're kind of negative. He's like, you know, at our church, we've been trying to think about how we can say everything really positively rather than just being negative. And I was like, I was kind of like, uh, and so I tried to find a, a positive way to say it. But that, that always kind of stuck in the back of my head. He was always, he was just like, you know, we, we need to just be positive. We just need to be positive. We can't just be, we can't be negative. We just need to be positive. And in the Bible, Jesus is not always positive. He's not always positive. Because he says negative things like, don't. Because there's danger. It's like when you are uh, teaching your kids, little kids, right? Uh, safety. And you don't want them to run out in the road. What if you're just like, honey, look how nice the sidewalk is. The sidewalk is so great. Just, I encourage you to walk in the sidewalk. Sidewalks are wonderful. What's missing? Don't go out in the road because you could get hit and hurt or die. That's a real thing, isn't it? And, and if we were only trying to be positive and just say, honey, just look how nice the sidewalk is. I encourage you to stay on the sidewalk. The sidewalk is so nice. And we don't put the negative out there. We're missing something important that they need to know. Right? And, and that's what Jesus is doing here. If, if there was a better way to put it, he would have. But there wasn't. This is what he said. Don't lay up your treasures on earth. But instead, lay up your treasures in heaven because there is a danger. And it's not just that they're going to depreciate and decay and disappear. There is another real danger to wrapping your heart and your life up in this world. He tells us in that verse 21, because, because where your treasure is, is where your heart is. Your treasure and your heart are roommates. They stay together. Okay? They stay together. You say, well, why is that such a big deal? Because the Bible tells us in Proverbs 4.23, keep your heart, watch your heart with all diligence because all the issues of life flow from your heart. Who you really are, what's really inside you. That's the direction of your life right there, where your heart is. That's why Jesus asked or said some hard things to those disciples. You, you can't follow me if you don't hate everybody else and love me most. It wasn't teaching us to hate people. He's wanting us to reflect and say, where is Jesus in my life? Because he knows that where Jesus is at in our life will determine the direction of our whole life. Everything will flow from it, starting with salvation but then after that, where is your heart? Where is your heart? Where is your true treasure? And he gives two warnings about a divided heart. That's the title of our message, is the danger of a divided heart. The first warning is about the darkness of earthbound treasures. When our heart and our treasures, we treasure the things of this world more than him, and they occupy our attention, our desires, our resources, and that's what our life is truly about. It's dangerous to us. Not just are you going to end up empty-handed, but Jesus says the light of the body is the eye. If therefore thine eye be single, thy whole body shall be full of light. But if thine eye be evil, thy whole body shall be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in thee be darkness, how great is that darkness. Here's the issue. Jesus is saying, if your heart is wrapped up, your treasure is tied to this earth, and your heart is wrapped up in there, it blinds you spiritually. It blinds you spiritually. You will not see you will not understand. You will not perceive those things that matters most. They, they can just slip right over your head. 
I was thinking today as I was studying for this message and the, and the message tonight, and there was a passage I was struggling with a lot, it occurred to me, and I was thinking, Lord, what's the point? What's the point? What's the point? And it occurred to me, maybe I'm not seeing this because it's something that I struggle with. Maybe the reason I'm not really seeing the point that Jesus is trying to hit here in this is because I'm struggling with this and I don't want to see it because it might require me to change. It might require a reordering of my priorities and my attitude in some ways. And so I started praying about that, that God would, would work in me so that I could see what I wasn't seeing. And, and I think maybe that's part of my problem. Is, is that it, the blindness was not that the text was unclear, it's the blindness was in me spiritually to not see those things. You see, when we're prizing something else more than him, it can blind us to things. It's like the Pharisees. A few weeks ago, I preached from, from Matthew 12, where Jesus healed a man on the Sabbath day. His hand was withered. In the, in the synagogue, on the Sabbath, Jesus healed a man, and the Pharisees wanted to destroy Jesus because he was breaking the Sabbath laws. And here's the point. Jesus read from the same Old Testament text that those Pharisees did. Same book. Same book. And the Pharisees walked away with all these rules about all the things you couldn't do, including healing on the Sabbath. And Jesus read the same book and said, it's right for me to heal this man today. How could two people look at the same thing and walk away with two different things like that? Doesn't it come down to where the heart's at? Doesn't it come down to where the heart's at, whether you can see what's really there or not? The other danger is trying to have it all. This is, this is so dangerous for us today, folks, because we live in the land of you can have everything. You can do it all. You can be it all. And so we try to pursue this. And we try to... To, to say, I want to be a good Christian, I want to follow Jesus, I want to love Jesus, and I also want to pursue all these things in the world, and I, I want to have all of it. And Jesus points out, look, you cannot have dual citizenship in this. You can't serve two masters, because either you're going to hate one and love the other, or hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. What about Samson? Remember Samson? The guy who was blessed by God with great strength. What was his downfall? He was a prophet of God. He was a judge called by God, blessed by God with phenomenal strength. But his heart also longed for the forbidden love of a woman. It was not a godly desire that he had. It was an ungodly desire that he had. And he lived his life trying to have it all. Trying to be the judge that he was called to be and then also to go after the women that he was interested in. How did that turn out for Samson? It did not work well for him because eventually he gave up the secret of his strength. His hair was cut. His eyes were gouged out, and he was made a slave and a mockery by the Philistines until his heart turned solely back to the Lord. You see, you cannot have dual citizenship in the sense of trying to have it all. You're going to have to go all in with one because if you try to put anything up there next to God in your life, you're going to be dishonoring God. It's just not going to work. It will play out and it will not work well. We cannot ride the fence. And so I, I want to transition now. We've kind of laid this foundation. I want to transition now, and I want us to do a short case study. And the case study is in the book of Galatians. If you want to turn there, I want to just read just a couple passages from Galatians and give you a, a high overview of what's going on in this book. This is one of, I believe, Paul's first letters that he wrote. And I had it on my heart this week to just, just read through Galatians, and so I sat and, and read through it. And, and the question I want us to ask 
because I believe Galatians shows us the answer to this question is, why do people fall away from the faith? Why do people fall away from the faith? What's going on? I mean, assuming that you've been blessed to hear the gospel and, and, and to, be, to be taught that true message, right? And to have experienced or tasted of the goodness of God and, and a salvation that's real that you can tell about and, and, and have that in your life. How is it that you could be blessed with that and that solid foundation and then fall away from it? Because that's exactly what was the danger for the Galatians. They were about to fall away from the simplicity of the gospel itself. And if we could agree, can we agree that there is nothing more important than to maintain the gospel? I mean, that's pretty, that's eternity, right? That's, that's everything <laughs> right there. If we can't preach and teach that right and have that as a conviction in our life, that's everything. Not just for us, but for the future generations. Well, this church was on the verge of, of, of losing the gospel. And as I started reading Galatians, I really didn't have an agenda. But I came to this first verse of Galatians chapter 1, verse 1, and I'm used to Paul's addresses where he introduces himself, pretty much every one, every letter he writes, he starts off, he says, I'm Paul, I'm a servant of God, I'm an apostle of Jesus Christ, whatever, he goes on and says this, but I noticed in Galatians 1, verse 1, as I read this passage, he gets really wordy, really wordy, and he says, Paul, an apostle, not of men, neither by man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. And as I read that, I stopped and I thought, I, I actually I went and I looked at all of Paul's other letters. He doesn't ever start off like that with that whole like, not of men, but of God. He doesn't start with that any place else. And I was thinking to myself, Why? Now, I believe there's answers to questions like this in the Word of God. So that kind of got me tuned in. I'm thinking, okay, what's going on here? Why does he do this? Because he makes a big deal that my apostleship is not from man, but it's from God. And so I, I decided as I continued to read Galatians that I was going to pay attention for things that, that picked up that theme, if there was anything there. And, and oh boy, it just completely changed the way that I saw this entire book. And so let me just read a segment for you here. Start in verse 6 of chapter 1. I'm just going to read verses 6 through 10. Paul writes, he says, I marvel, I am amazed that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another. But there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which was preached to you, let him be accursed. As we said before, so now I say again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that you have received, let him be accursed. For do I now persuade men or God? Or do I seek to please men? For if I yet pleased men, I should not be the servant of Christ. Look at what's going on here. There is a surface issue. The surface issue is a big deal. They are twisting the gospel. And here's, here's what was happening. Paul mentions that there were people who had come in and they had been teaching these Christians that it's not just faith and repentance toward Christ that gets you saved, but it's also circumcision. If you're a guy, you have to be circumcised to be saved. It's got to be both. They were trying to reintroduce some of those Old Testament laws and said, if it's going to be real, if you're really going to have it, it's got to be faith in Christ and circumcision. 
And wind of this was getting back to the Apostle Paul. And so, as you could expect, much of this letter is about why salvation is only faith alone in Christ. And Paul says, it doesn't matter who would tell you any different, even if it's me, or an angel from heaven, as the Mormons would believe, what happened to them. It doesn't matter who. There is no other gospel than the one you've got that came from God. And if anybody else says anything different, let them be accursed. So this is a big deal, right? This, this whole different gospel thing is a, is a huge deal. That's the surface issue. But you got to ask the question, why? Why did this happen? What was going on that moved? Paul said, I'm amazed that you have so quickly deserted the truth of the gospel into this thing that's not even a gospel. What was it? What was it that was causing this problem? Why did the Galatians do this? And if you read all of Galatians, and I encourage you for a homework assignment, go back and read Galatians with this, with this question in your mind. What was going on? Paul hits the nail on the head, and he kind of does it throughout, but it's, this is the most succinct verse that covers this. It says in Galatians 4.17, they... These people who were teaching this false gospel, they make much of you, but for no good purpose, they want to shut you out that you may make much of them. So they had these false teachers. Here's what was going on. These false teachers that were coming into their fellowship at the church. And they were so nice. They were so friendly. They, they were just bragging on them, bragging on them, telling them how wonderful they were, this, this, and this, and they really liked these people. These people also held this belief that it's not just faith alone in Christ, it's faith alone and keeping the law. And what was the issue? Well, they just really liked those people a lot. They just thought they were really, really nice, right? Right? They, they just liked them so much and they, and they wanted to impress them. They wanted to please them because they liked them so much. And so what was the root of the issue? They cared about those people more than they cared about Christ and his word. And because they started to exalt these people in their heart, they quit serving Christ. That's why Paul said, look, my apostleship is not to please men. It's not from men. It's not to please men. It's from God. It's to please God. That's why Paul said in that previous passage, if I pleased men, I would not be the servant of Christ. Because why? Because you cannot have dual citizenship, can you? Right? We learned that. You cannot try to keep your feet on both sides of the fence. It's got to be God first and foremost if you're going to be faithful to him. We can't try to ride this fence. In fact, it's even in Galatians, the Apostle Paul talks about the Apostle Peter. I mean, Peter was there when Jesus preached the Sermon on the Mount. He was very faithful. I mean, he wasn't perfect, but he got turned around and God used him in a great way. But Paul talks about an incident where they were with a group of Christians who were mixed Gentile and Jewish. And Peter, when he was there, came time for the fellowship meal, He'd sit down and eat with anybody. Gentile, Jew, didn't matter. But then there came to visit some people from the circumcision party who believe you had to be circumcised to be saved. And they came, and all of a sudden, what did Peter do? Peter quit eating with the Gentiles at the church fellowship meal because he knew that the people who were of the circumcision wouldn't approve of it, and he wanted to make them happy. And Paul said, and it wasn't just Peter, it was Barnabas too. And what did, Peter, what did Paul have to do? He said, I confronted them to their face and said, look, the way you're acting is not consistent with the gospel. Because you're caring more about what everybody else thinks than you are caring about what God thinks. And you are confusing the gospel message because you should be able to eat with any of these people. Right? 
This is the same book where Paul addresses that issue. Well, why did the false teachers do this? What was, what was their motive? Paul explains their motive in, in chapter 6, verse 12. He says that it's those who want to make a good showing in the flesh who would force you to be circumcised and, not, and, only, excuse me, and only in order that they may not be persecuted for the cross of Christ. The false teachers were trying to do this to avoid Jewish persecution. That was one of the, the earliest persecutions that early church faced was the Jews. And if they could try to tell everybody that, look, what we're doing is really just, it's, it's, just a, it's pretty much Judaism. We believe in circumcision. We believe in keeping all the laws. They could get rid of the persecution, right? And so that was the motivation of the false teachers because they cared more about their own skin than they cared about allegiance to Jesus Christ. Well, what happens when you try to be loyal to Christ and please people, save your own skin, chase what you want, what happens when you try to do that? Well, Paul tells these Christians, and this is hard. He says, behold, I, Paul, say unto you that if you be circumcised, if you're going to be circumcised and trust in that as part of your salvation. Christ will profit you nothing. For I testify again to every man that is circumcised that he is a debtor to do the whole law. Christ is become of no effect unto you. Whosoever of you are justified by the law, you are fallen from grace. Paul said if you try to attach anything else to salvation besides faith alone in Christ... You don't have a gospel that can save. You don't have a gospel that can save. And if you believe you need that in order to be saved, Paul says, sounds like you never had it to begin with. Amen. Because you should know that it was faith in Christ alone that got you what you have. You see, this is dangerous. It's dangerous. Why do people depart the faith, a solid faith, we can talk about all the things that they fall into, right? We can talk about all the different things people fall into or just completely drift off into nothing. But what is the root reason? You know, I, I could sit and talk to somebody who is drifting into a false religion until I'm blue in my face trying to talk to them about why this is wrong and this, that, and the other and talk about all the Bible verses that prove it's wrong. But if in their heart of hearts they really want something more than Jesus... None of my words and none of your words are going to make any difference. Because if the heart of hearts is that I want something else more than I want Jesus, then there is no end to the ways in which we can drift, right? And so Paul, when he was trying to help these people, was trying to bring them back to this point. Where is your heart? Do you have a divided heart? What who is most important in your life? I want to close with the prayer of David in Psalm 86. If you're like me and you realize that your heart is divided at times and that you struggle with keeping Christ where he belongs in your life, you find yourself in good company, not because I'm there, because David was there. Because other believers, even like Peter, clearly struggled with this thing. And here in Psalm 86, David prays, and I think this is a wonderful prayer for us to have. He says, Teach me thy way, O Lord, I will walk in thy truth. Unite my heart to fear thy name. I will praise thee, O Lord my God, with all my heart, and I will glorify thy name forevermore. He prays to the Lord, help me to have a heart that is united on you. Not trying to have it all, not hedging my bets and other things, but have a heart that is united and fully desires Christ more than anything else. Because that is what will keep us on track. That will put us on track. That will keep us on track more than anything else in this world. To have a heart united, fully focused on Jesus Christ.
Lost friend, until you want Christ more than anything else, you will not have him. And Christian friend, unless our heart is united to follow after him, we're going to veer off the path. And there will be much loss in our life. And it will play out. We can go and even try to have it all and play superficial religion. But there will be loss unless Christ is at the center of who we are and what we do. I hope in some way that this is a, is a challenge to you. That whatever God needs to speak to your heart today through His Spirit, that He, he pricks you with it. He moves you in it. Because it's something every one of us need to consider.